Glad I got the song up there. Sister Kay uh, sent me the song. It was No More No More Night, uh, by the way. It's funny, when I when I went to uh, go put the lyrics up there, I, my my computer auto-corrected me to uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy, but I got the right one up there. <laughs> my Alice Cooper, I would have been in trouble if that one was up there. But thank you, Sister Kay. Such a, I'm so, so blessed by her and their performance. So let's get this crowd fired up. You want to help me out? Maybe that's it. Who's ready for some good preaching? Who's ready for good preaching? Me too, me too. Y'all let me know if y'all y'all hear about anything, okay? Mr. Isaiah, you know what? Why don't you go ahead and why don't you read the first part of today's the days to verse, okay? We're gonna start with a with a verse today. I'm gonna let you read the first part. You can read it right here if you want. I got it right here in front of me. Okay, go ahead. Do not be surprised, my brothers, and if the world hates you. Amen. And I'll take over from here. Good job, Isaiah. Thank you again, man. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not have or does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Amen. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The word of God. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for, for guiding me in, in preparation. Lord, I ask that you guide me in presentation. Lord, I ask for the Holy Spirit to guide me. May my words be your words and not my, my own. May I use my own personality that you gave me to declare your truths, Lord. And I ask that this be a blessing to the listener, to the viewer, and to the congregation. In your name, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So have you ever gone to your favorite restaurant and got some bad service there? You know, I know that's all happened to us. You know, I, I'm a creature of habit. I say that a lot. And, you know, I like food. I think it comes with being a Baptist pastor. We, we love to eat. <laughs> uh, maybe just a southern thing, but I love to eat. And so, you know, I love going to A1, and I've always got pretty good service there at A1. Uh, and I go to Chili's, and I usually get pretty good service there, but occasionally I've gotten some bad service. It still doesn't change that the food is good food, but we still have had awful dining experiences. You know, like Whataburger. Whataburger, you know, it's, it's water. I love Whataburger every now and then. Well, I say every now and then. Probably a couple of times a week, I'll have, I'll have a Whataburger. But occasionally they're going to mess up my order from time to time. You know, we've all had bad service. What about church? Have we ever gone to church and had bad service at church? Yeah, we have. We've gone to church and we've had bad service at church. Have you ever had a bad experience at church? Yes, we've had bad experiences at church. Did that experience at that church, you know, did it cause you to walk out? Did it cause you to be upset? Did it make you feel like you weren't treated right? I've been there. You know, it, it may have been the pastor, it may have been the worship leader, it may have been someone in the congregation. In some cases, sadly, this is true, and it has happened. But there's one person in this church or at that church that you can't say mistreated you. And that's God. God has always treated you right. You know, remember, the food is always good at that particular restaurant. And if your church is Christ-centered then God is definitely good. Meaning we can say God is good here and our food is good here too. Essentially, going to church is the same as getting fed, y'all. Did y'all know that? When you go to church, you get fed. You get fed spiritually. And sadly, in some cases, you go to church and you, they, they're, they're feeding you junk food. You know, but we, 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 we try to do our due diligence, and we should do our due diligence, whether it be a Sunday school, whether it be here in the pulpit. And we want to make sure that you get fed right. You're going to have all your helpings and all your fixings and all that good stuff. I'm going to stop saying that because, you know, it's getting close to noontime. I'm going to get, start getting hungry. But we want to make sure you get fed spiritually. So today I want to serve up some good food, not because I'm such a good cook, but because God is the best. And his word tastes good, and it fills up your soul. <clears throat> I've run across many folks who have actually used Scripture. And I know y'all have had these, these folks before. They use Scripture as a scapegoat. 
Have they ever done that? You know, they 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 they, 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 they use the axe. They might not be know know that they're using axe, but axe states right for someone avoid, who wants to avoid going to church. Acts 17 states, the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So when you read the verse out of context, well, it seems plain forward. Well, guess what? I don't have to go to church. I don't have to go to the temple, right? True. Very true. However, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill was to a Greco-Roman society. And guess what all those great Romans were doing? They're dedicating their lives to these pagans. All the beautiful temples and ruins that we have today, that's what they're doing. They're building those temples to celebrate those pagan gods. So Paul was actually talking about them. He wasn't talking about the actual church building. But he's still right. You don't need to go to church to necessarily be with God, to worship God. But what Paul was saying is, is true. But... Furthermore, Paul was not telling folks not to attend church, not to attend the true church, to stay out of fellowship with true believers. You know, my, my brother Kyle, he's a real smart guy, and I wish, I want to, I keep trying to bring him to church, and, you know, Sister Case met him, uh, my family's met him, I'd like to meet him one day, but he's really smart. I took one of his quotes, I said, Kyle, give me a quote, you know, some years back, give me a quote about going to church, and he said, I saved his quote here, and it says, um, or it says, the church body the church, the body, is a community of believers who, through the Bible, share in God's word and learn the truths of God and the truth he has for his people. And in learning truth, we are accountable to the Father as well as one another, of which we base our accountability from Scripture. Well said, brother. If you ask me this point blank, you know, I, I want to be one of those educated guys, but, you know, and I am to some extent, but when you talk to me, I, I, you ask me point blank, why should you go to church? I just think, you know what? Because you need to get fed. And because it feels pretty darn good going to church. I remember times my mom would she'd drag me to church. I, I'd be honest when I was a kid, I hated going to church. I was like, Mom, I was gonna sit here and play my video games, right? Oh, y'all, y'all don't some of y'all don't remember computers. What do y'all do? MS DOS, right? I type in the, the computer games, I'd sit there and play on my computer games. And here I am, I got the kid, my kids do the same thing. My mom, I don't want to go to church. Guess what? I get drugged to church. I feel pretty darn good coming back. She drug me to that church one day and I got saved. I got saved. I didn't want to go that day. You know, even as an adult, even it's sad to say this, even as an adult, someone who went to seminary school before I came to pastor this church, my own wife would drag me to church. Can y'all believe that? She would make me go to church. I'm an adult. I don't want to go to church. And as an adult, I was like, wow, I'd go to church and I would feel so good over there at New Song Fellowship. And I was, wow. You know, the devil does the darndest things. One of the things he does, he wants to keep us from going to church. I know everybody has certain reasons. We got, we got medical reasons. We got family reasons why we can't go to church. So uh, I'm not picking on any on particular this today. I just wanted to, to touch base on this. So God never, you know. God never says, "Hey, not to be out of not to be in uh, not to be out of fellowship with each other." So, some people feel like you know they don't go to church because God gave up on them. You ever feel like that? God gave up on me. Some people feel um, that God gave up on them. Yes, there were times even I felt like God gave up on me. However, that's far from the truth. God never gives up on you. Or any of his children. Somebody in this room stand up right now and say, Jesus Christ doesn't give up on me. Somebody stand up in this room and say, Jesus Christ doesn't give up on me. I was looking at you, I was waiting for you to do it, sister. All right, just see if y'all paying attention. So, you know, he doesn't quit on you, but we choose to quit on him. That's what happened. We choose to quit on him. Even though he hears our prayers. He knows our deepest thoughts, and he identifies with us more than we do ourselves. Amen. That is our God. That is our Father. This is hard for some of us. It's hard for some of us to, to maybe swallow this pill, especially when we're in doubt, because we don't understand God's reason for the current situations that had happened. And I, and I struggle with that, too, especially now. Brother Carl was talking about We've never just seen so much death this time, you know, and I do the same Carl, thing, thing Carl does, you know, I'll be up late at night, and let me check Charlie Marshall's, let me check Seaside, let me check 
And there's people I know on there. And that, that, just, that is the truth. And it's a tough situation. So much has been lost. And so many times, you know, sometimes it might even seem hopeless. That's a common feeling for people that are struggling with overcoming various obstacles, overcoming life, overcoming trauma, overcoming addiction. You know, there's often a feeling of hopelessness. And many suffer from regret from the mistakes that have been made. The mindset is indeed pointless. Even thinking that way itself is hopeless. One thing that's not hopeless in this life is Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing that's not hopeless is prayer to him. Never give up on prayer to him. And his word, because his word is all truth. Truth is a fact or belief that's accepted as truth. Doubt is to be uncertain about something. To be undecided in opinion about belief, right? Undecided, right? Truth is the opposite of doubt. If God is truth and his word is truth, then God is not doubt. He is not doubt. The Lord says that doubt is a lack of faith because we all should be fully trusting in him. It is doubt that's actually a violation of our faith in God. The devil uses doubt which becomes worry. It's what happens, it festers, it festers into fear. And then fear paralyzes us. And that's what the devil aims to do. The devil aims to paralyze us in fear. We're paralyzed in fear, guess what? We're not out there serving the Lord. We're not out there doing everything that the Lord has planned for us because he's planned so much for you. And remember this, I've told you all this before, is that every one of us in here, every one of us is good to the last drop. You are good to the last drop. All right? Just like that old coffee. I told you I like to drink that blue coffee. That coffee is good to the last drop. Every one of my friends in here, you are good to the last drop. So we should never fear the devil. Or even we should never fear the crazy world we live in. We must fear the Lord, though. Listen to the word of God. It states in Proverbs 1, 7, 8, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It said the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What kind of knowledge are we talking about, right? It's a spiritual understanding of God. It is his word. There is no doubt in his word because it is more than truth. It is absolutely more than truth. You wanna know why his word is more than truth? Because it's reached absolute perfection, true perfection. We talk about things we've done perfect. God has truly done things perfect. His word is truly perfect. In his word, there's no doubt, because he's more than truth, that it's reached perfection, which only God can do. And the Bible's about God, and it shows the love of God. Ephesians 3, 19, one of my favorite verses states, The love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That is what God's all about. You come to church to get your bellies full of his word and full of his love. That's what we're feeling up, right? And the good thing about the good thing about God's love, right? Because you know, we can overeat physical food, right? I do it all the time. I'm probably fixing to do this after this sermon. But with God's love, you cannot fill up too much on his love. You cannot be sluggish. Oh, I have too much of God's love in my belly. I have too much of his word in my belly. I'm sluggish and I feel like I can't, you know, I, I can't take any more. It's not the case with God's love. The love of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the highest love there is. It's the most powerful love that exists. It's more colossal than the world and more immense than the universe itself. And I'm not just being poetic when I say that. It truly is. It truly is the highest and most powerful love we can imagine. I don't know if we can even imagine. I don't think we even comprehend how powerful and how much his love is. And yet... We live in a world that promotes the opposite of God's love. And what the world needs is his love. And I was trying to remember, I was trying to, I was talking to Sister Ken, and Brother Robert, I was like, what is that song? It reminded me of that song, what the world needs. Love, love, sweet love. And that's what that was reminding me of. What the world needs is God's love. God's sweet love. And the, 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 the irony and the sad thing is those, they have it. They have it right there in front of them. 
We have it right in front of us. But before we talk about our world today, I want to I want to go back to, uh, to understanding the context of this book, which is a letter of the Apostle John, First John, which is a letter of the Apostle John wrote in wrote from Ephesus in around 90 A.D. This is where this is when and where the book of John was written. John was a Jew from the city of Bethsaida, near the Sea of Galilee. His father Zebedee was his was his older uh, and his older brother James were all fishermen. After the miracle of the drought of the fishes, John and his brother James became apostles. John was one of the three apostles closest to Jesus, such as Peter and James. According to tradition, John spent many years as a pastor in Ephesus. And um, 1 John was written to his contemporary Christian uh, brethren to assure them of their salvation. Basically, he was saying that if once saved, then all we saved. And the Apostle John addressed the role of the Holy Spirit, which also reassured the Christians that they were indeed children of God. Holy Spirit. Furthermore, he lectures to the ancient Christians that they have violated areas within the Christian life, which causes them, now get this church, I want y'all to listen to this, lean in closely, which causes them not to hear the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. We can let things fester in our life. We can let worldly things, we can let things in front of our face that can actually cause us not to hear the Holy Spirit. So therefore, the reason that the Christians back then repeatedly doubted the assurance of their salvation is because they're out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which means they're out of fellowship with God. The problems faced back then in Ephesus remain relevant today. There are some folks that are out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, as well as their Christian uh, brothers and sisters. And I think that sometimes we forget what this whole understanding of God is about. What it's about is when a believer, like you and I, when we come to know God through Jesus, we get to experience his greatest attribute, which is love. God's sweet love. God's love deals with the hate of the world. The first part of the verse in today's text states, Do not be surprised, believers, if the world hates you. Yes, don't be surprised, believers. That's you, me, and everyone who has believed and become a disciple or made disciples. We're in a world that hates us. What is the world? It is the worldly affairs, the aggregate of things. And the world aggregate, I see that in insurance a lot. But this is actually the Greek text. But the insurance, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole of things. It's, 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 it's the grand, grandiose of things. Earthly, it's the endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, that all the hollow, frail, momentary, they still disturb, stir desire and seduce us from God. The world is simply this, my friends. It's nothing more than an obstacle to the cause of Jesus Christ. We can see how the world hates the believers by pursuing with hatred, detesting the disciples and diverting us away from God. The ancient Greek expands on this by saying the world is an obstacle to the cause of Christ. It's a hindrance, it's a distraction, and a problem for anyone who makes Jesus Christ their highest priority. And first and above all things. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to make Jesus Christ our highest priority. And let's face it, I think sometimes that's, I think that's one of those things that we have to keep on taking inventory of ourselves. At least I do this. I take my own spiritual inventory and say, God, am I really placing you first? I need to place you first. How many times have I let family come first? And that's that seems like a legitimate thing. But the thing is, though, it's funny how it works. When we actually place God first, all those little things that fall in the lines behind that, it actually it actually ends up working out better. Again, it's that old devil trying to get you to doubt, trying to pull on your flesh, tug on the weak flesh, and tell you that this thing is more important than God. And it's not. Because God loves us all. 
And God, believe it or not, it's crazy to think this. As much as I love my kids, I love my boys. I love my wife. And I love my boys too. But I love my boys so much. It's hard to swallow this, but God loves my kids more than I do. God loves my mom more than I do. He loves my wife more than I do. And that's saying a lot. So think about that. Think about placing him first. So to us, Jesus is the Savior. He is Jesus the Christ. And to the spiritually mature, the faithful disciple, we that believe, we know this. We know that with Jesus, we are everything. And without him, we're nothing. The world brings many temptations and distractions to all people, not just believers. Those who have a love for the world, they can receive many worldly riches. But in the end, they only obtained, they only obtained emptiness. And it reminds me of that classic Upton Sinclair novel. Which actually the movie was better, but there was an old there was old there's a movie that came out. It's called There Will Be Blood. It was a, it was an oil, oil 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 man movie, and throughout the movie, this man he becomes he becomes wealthier and more powerful, and he keeps becoming more monetary things keep coming to happen to him. But in the end, on the inside, he becomes spiritually bankrupt, and he becomes empty because he becomes, he's so detached from the from 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 spirituality. He's so detached from God. That none of the things in his life, none of these material things in his life can make him happy. Even money, nothing can make him happy. God could have made him happy. Now, again, he's a fictional character, by the way. But I can't help but think about that. So those who have a love for the world, they can receive all those worldly things. But in the end, they obtain emptiness. The consequences without God, God's love. There are severe consequences without God's love. <clears throat> Through knowing Christ are for an eternity. It's only through his love who keeps us from being bothered by the hate of the world. And God would have us understand today that the love of Christ has literally brought us from death to life. Literally. I think I got to talk about that yesterday at the memorial service. And that's what it is. It, it's, it's life when we know Christ, it's actually life leading to another life. <laughs> when we die in this world, it's life leading to another life. I couldn't imagine life right now without that life, without knowing that, without having that love. I couldn't imagine that. I would be so empty. I would be so lost. I would be paralyzed in fear, but I'm not because I know Jesus Christ, because I have him as my Savior, because I love him as my Savior. I can know that there is hope. I know there's hope. So according to verse 14, we have come from death to life. It states, we know that we have passed from death to life. The words, I'm going to get a little bit nerdy on y'all. I haven't done that in a while. I'm going to get a little bit nerdy with my, my ancient Greek stuff. So uh, the words, three words, we have passed. Denotes the equivalent of being removed from the word from. In the verse, it denotes completion and perfection. We're talking about perfection again. So therefore, we have passed or have been removed from the completion of the cause of death. That's what God has done for us. But remember this. It cost him his own blood. It cost him pain, suffering, torment, mental anguish. But he did it for us. He did it because of his love for you and I. That is because we've passed from life, from death to life. What is the verse saying? We hear the word life. I'm glad you asked. It is also what's obtained in the fellowship of Christ. It's important to fellowship with our Lord Savior and to fellowship with his church, which is indeed the body of believers whom sin in themselves, not on each other, but on Jesus. And I know many people... I know many people have told me, I think my dad was one of them. He told me, um, I, I know God, or well, actually it wasn't my dad. He didn't know God to the last point, but I, it's, maybe it was a guy like my dad. Many, many, many men like that. Myself at one point. Oh, I, I know God. I, I, I've accepted Jesus and I love Jesus, but 
I don't need to go to church. I don't need to, to be involved in church. I don't need to go to these events. Or the Bible says we don't have to go to church to worship God. It's all very true. It's actually very true. It is. So I want to say that's true. But yet, me and some of those men that are like that, we've used the word of God to justify ourselves and not what God wants. God wants you to be here. God wants you to be here to fellowship. God wants you to be involved. This means that we're out of fellowship. when We don't do what God wants us to do. With either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. That all means you're out of fellowship with God. They're the same person. Indeed, we've had bad experiences at churches, and people find that, you know, that things can hinder the essence of church, which is God. However, that's not a reason to stop. It's not a reason to not do what God wants you to do. So if you have doubt today, if you have anything that's hindering you or you feel like it's hindering you from church, or hindering you from, from fellowshipping with somebody just over a cup of coffee. And that's why I talk about fellowship. It could be just fellowshipping with someone for a cup of coffee, having lunch with somebody, calling another believer, checking on each other. And remember this, is that we are a body of believers. That's what makes us a body of believers, each one of us. Each one of us is special in this church. Every single one of you are special and important to this church. Let us pray. Father God, I just thank you, Jesus. I thank you for, for your wonderful word, word, Lord. I thank you for, 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 these, for, these, for these, these seats being filled up today, Lord. And it's been tough, Lord. I know it's been tough with, with, the, with the pandemic. We've had people that are sick. And I just want this church to know that I'm not picking on anybody in particular. This is just the message that you had today. If somebody's got something on their heart, Lord, you're going to put it on their heart and they're going to they're going to they're going to say, Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I'm going to do what you want me to do, Jesus. I just want you to bless everybody here, Lord. Just 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 guide them, Lord. Give them the strength, Lord, because we know we're weak. I'll admit this. I'm a weak man, but I am a strong man in Jesus Christ and only strong because of you. And I pray that we all just seek you, Lord, that we we reach out to one another, Lord, and we continue to to grow in Christ like this. Lord, I pray that you grow this church spiritually and numerically. In Jesus' name, amen. We dare not end a sermon or a service without offering a lifeline. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, why don't you come up on here right up front today and let's talk about that. If you have a special prayer, you need special prayer, come on up. Come right here during our invitational hymn. We want you to come up. If you're on our feed, go ahead and start typing in our prayers or your prayer requests. We'll be right there in just a second. Um, if you want to join this church, you're looking to join this church, just send us a message or, or come on up uh, during now or during the invitational hymn. Thank you. Let's stand together and turn to page 305. <laughs> Folks, let's uh, pray for our folks on the feed. Uh, Father God, let's lift up our, our EMS and frontline workers. Thank you for our military. Lift them up, Lord. Lord, uh, protect um, Sister Yvonne and the Jones family. Uh, Lord, I just pray for everybody. Did I get everybody, baby? Oh, no, oh, no. Oh, there we got some more. I always miss them. Okay. Oh. Oh. Dear Heavenly Father, let's go ahead and lift up Andy Manchaka. Uh, and his 20-year-old sister and spawn. Oh, they're on a ventilator. Lift them up, folks, and just um, lift these folks that are all in, in, in the COVID ward. It's been tough. I know it is. I've, I've gone and I've seen them personally. Lord, lift up uh, uh, Veronica Costa, uh, Rhonda Lindowski. Forgive me if I mispronounce these names. Miranda Sue Banda, Gentry Jones family. 
Robert and Diane, we love Robert and Diane. Oh yeah, and Patricia again. We're gonna lift them up, lift up the the the, the loved ones. And, and Brother Robert, we thank you for our worship leader. Uh, Lord, we just lift up uh, all those that are sick and anybody that that I might have left off. And uh, Brother Robert, would you be so kind to close us out in final prayer? My gracious heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the comfort of his wellness, Lord, that teaches us. Also, Lord, for your word, we thank you for that. Give us a desire to read it, memorize it, and apply it. Join us all now, Lord, as we leave here. Let us touch the lives of others and win them to you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. amen.